This is the Always Direct Podcast, and we talk with movers and shakers of this world to learn about the ups and downs they went through to get where they are now. Let's get started with the show. Hello, everyone. I'm your host, John Rian, and my guest today on the Always Direct Podcast is Steve Delinsky, and I'm a huge fan of Steve and his personality. He's a very famous figure here in the Chicago area because of many years on his hit show, ABC 7's Hungry Hound with Steve Delinsky. Now he's doing pizza tours, consulting, and traveling the world eating amazing food, and I'm very excited to hear his story and pick his brain. Steve, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. Yeah, so Steve... Uh, I really like to just start off by asking what's happening in your world with all the COVID craziness, the winter blizzards, blizzards in Chicago, and what are you doing these days? So this is a very COVID timely interview and appearance on your show because I am in Northern Florida uh, in the Panhandle. And before I announced that I was leaving ABC7 a couple months ago, my wife and I planned to just rent an Airbnb for the month of February with uh, my sister and brother-in-law and have a big enough place so the four of us could kind of spread out and work because of COVID, because the last 10, 11 months, I've been doing solo reporting. I mean, I'm shooting, I'm editing everything on my own. So I don't need to be in Chicago physically to edit and produce the pieces. I need to be there to shoot the stories. But what I did in January was I shot a bunch of stories and then I brought them all with me to Florida and I've been editing and sending them back to the station, you know, using email. So it's really kind of a unique situation. I figured I could be somewhere for a month and not to be tied to Chicago. Fortunately, we, we missed the, bl- the blizzard and the cold, which is great. It's chilly here, as you can see, I'm wearing a coat. Uh, it's going to get up to like 59 today, but um, it's a lot warmer than Chicago. Yeah, definitely. 59, you, you can definitely handle 59 if you're coming from the Midwest, right? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, COVID's really provided a lot of opportunities for people like me who have always been freelancing. I mean, I've been at ABC for 17 years, but I was never considered just staff there I was able to do the pizza tour business the pizza book pizza podcast you know all the other things I'm doing with pizza city USA they've let me do that and now because I'm not at ABC anymore I can kind of create my own content for whomever I'm going to be partnering with a brand I'm going to announce next week uh, for about a month and a half I'm going to be working with some real estate groups to help consult and and curate uh, spaces for them to find the right restaurant or the right chef or the right group to go into a space I couldn't do that before at ABC. Really? So are you, so are you going to be working in any, in any way, shape or form with ABC or is it just going to be completely disconnected? Well, we we're, I'm leaving on very good terms. So, you know, on the way out the door, they said, if you want to come back and do a special, maybe do a pizza show, you know, do a special one-off food show. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I'm serving out my contract. So, uh, you know, through the end of February, and they're letting me do that. They're letting me have a sign off this Friday, uh, which is the 19th. I'm not sure when the show is going to run for you, but I'm running Friday the 19th is my last live shot. And then Saturday night, the 20th is my last sort of taped piece. Um, But we have a very good relationship. So, yeah, I'll probably be coming back to ABC in some form. And certainly when my next pizza book comes out in September, uh, which is the ultimate Chicago pizza guide, a history of squares and slices in the Windy City, that's going to be talked about on ABC as well. Oh, that sounds that sounds good. I'm definitely gonna. Is it gonna be available on Audible? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. Good, good. Um, I have uh, five credits. I'd like to spend it on that. Get, get, it, get it. <laughs> I, I, I love pizza. I mean, I'm in the pizza business. I'm in the pizza industry. I love everything about it. And you're famous. I mean, you know, I don't know if your fame stretches out how far it goes around the Midwest or in the Chicago. Oh, tens of miles. Tens of miles. <laughs> Maybe even dozens of miles. But you're everywhere here. Like, I don't give a sh- I don't care where you go. <laughs> every restaurant you walk into, it's just like, there's Steve Delinsky. There's Steve Delinsky. Yeah, you know, you're at every restaurant wall. Because when you come in, you change people's lives. Yeah, I mean, it. well, having the, the platform of ABC has been great. You know, they let me yeah. do whatever I want to do. And it's sort of like, I don't know what the, uh, the analogy is. Like, they have the rails. And so getting to be on their rails to deliver the content has been great. Now, I'm going to attempt to continue creating the same content I've been doing, but putting it on my own rails, which is my own YouTube channel, my own website, which is why I'm redoing the website and redoing the YouTube channel, because people still want good content. You know, they may not have to tune into channel seven. I mean, I think people under the age of 50, under 55, they don't really watch television like we used to when I was a kid. We didn't, you know, they don't, they're not making appointment television. They're looking on their phones to watch stuff. So if I can deliver it to them on their phones pretty easily, I'm hoping that becomes 
you know, my next phase. But in terms of the popularity thing, that's all because of ABC and they've, you know, they've let me do whatever I want to do. Um, but I, believe me, getting to change people's trajectories overnight has been one of the most rewarding things about the job because you see a little joint like, well, up by you in the suburbs, Aurelio's uh, uh, the pizza on fire is over there in Addison. You know, it's a great little joint that nobody really knew about. We put them on the air and they, they went huge. Yeah. And, and that's, it's, it's a great feeling. I'm sure. I mean, that the must make your, your, your job. I mean, first I'm sure you're making great money and happy and successful, but also like you're really helping people. You're really helping people. a yeah. lot. I mean, that's a great feeling. It is a great feeling. Yeah, I get great notes from people. I mean, the Facebook stuff on my page, the day that I announced was just overwhelming and people saying, you know, you helped make our business and you gave us a big, push the first you know couple of weeks and you know we couldn't have been successful without that so that that really means a lot yeah yeah i mean it's big it's big so um i don't want to take i don't want to take this to a downer downturn but i just want to see how are you i'm sure a ton of people come to you with regards to covid19 and how it's affecting their business what are you seeing when you have your finger on the on the on the on the pulse of the economy in this little midwest in the midwest over here what are yeah. you seeing what are you finding well well the places that did not have a lot of capital I and mean, this is the big problem the, the overarching picture is that restaurants in general and hospitality did not get good bailouts they didn't get a lot of ppp money you know unless you were ruth's chris or potbelly or someone with a lot of lobbyist muscle behind you a lot of the little mom and pops did not get a lot of money so unless you're well capitalized and have a lot of money in the bank which a lot of restaurants frankly just don't because they're run on shoestring budgets they get screwed and a lot of places have closed and i think what we're going to see in the next probably eight to 12 months, because it's going to take that long to get everybody vaccinated and to get sort of back to somewhat normal, the places that are still around are going to do really well. The places that have managed to just hang on by a thread, if they can continue their business and get through this, they're going to see a lot of people coming out of the woodwork to support restaurants because we're all going stir crazy, right? <laughs> we all want to, we all want to get back to just sort of having a beer with a friend and having a dinner with somebody we love and, and, and someone that we want to spend time with. And so we're going to be looking for places to go. And so places that can hang on for another eight to 10 months, I think are going to see business surge. Um, but I think you're going to see a lot of, it's sort of a culling of the herd. You know, a lot of places that were just barely hanging on are just not going to make it anymore. And the, the one unfortunate thing that's happening with the current downturn is that you're, the only restaurants that can survive are the ones that can transport food successfully. So thicker pizzas, uh, chicken fried, maybe sandwiches, burgers, you know, but fries don't travel well. Um, anything fried doesn't travel well. And I'm finding a, it's a real challenge to bring food back home or to get it delivered. And I don't wanna get it delivered because a lot of these third parties are taking a 30% chunk out of the profits of the restaurateur. So I either pick it up myself or I make sure if the restaurant has its own in-house delivery system, then I will use it, but I will not use a third-party delivery company because they're just screwing the mom and pops. Steve, thanks for bringing that up. I I, um, I, I have uh, the marketing company, always direct um, mail.com, and we, we help restaurants across the country with marketing their product. And I beg them, including my own businesses, I, I, I beg them just, if you have to be on the third party, do something to con convert them do whatever it takes because having that da data, having them go to your website is priceless and these guys are gouging you. You can use them as a marketing tool, but if you, it's like a drug addict, you can't get away from it. And, and eventually yeah. it, they, 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 it's like a, they're cannibalizing, you're cannibalizing yourself. It's sort of like, you know, I never really understood Groupon for restaurants. I mean, those never really worked for the restaurant. I mean, there's a great deal for someone to come in and spend the minimum and get maybe a free appetizer. But I, I don't think you're really building loyalty that way. And uh, you know, I think if you have to resort to that, your business is probably in trouble. You probably need to think about something else in terms of writing the ship. But I just, those discounts and those cheap ways and the, uh, you know, the convenience doesn't always help. And you know, if you really love those restaurants, support them, you know, go pick up the damn food. Or like I say, if, if they ha offer their own delivery, use that. But boy, I would try to avoid the third parties. It's just really, it goes down a, a bad path. Yeah, yeah. From your from your mouth to the customers' uh, to the yeah. ears, I hope they, they follow that lead. So, Steve, how did you get started in this? I mean, this is this is you started this before YouTube and before all this other mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, how did you get into the entertainment business and, and become a pizza expert? 
Yeah, I'm an old man. Um, I still get the newspaper delivered to my house. That's how old I am. Uh, New York Times, by the way. Are you so serious? I, are you, do you, yeah, you really? I get the New York Times every day. Yeah, absolutely. You like um, what do you what do you like the, the texture in your hands when you you know the tradition? I like that something tangible. I like being able to see everything at a glance. And the late Tim Russert, a uh, member from uh, NBC, had this great quote about, it gives you uh, sort of the peripheral view. It gives you the perspective. You don't necessarily need to read every headline and yeah. read every story, but I can just see a headline and kind of know what's going on in the world without having to dive that deep. If, and if something is interesting, that's great. But if you only look at your feeds, you're only going to be served a diet of what you want and what you're interested in. And I, I want to just see the, the big picture. So that's why I think it's important to get the paper every day. But anyway, how I got into this was I was a general assignment news reporter. Uh, I played my dues. I, after University of Wisconsin, I went to, to Upper Michigan. I worked in the UP for a year as a one-man band. I went to Davenport, Iowa, and Rock Island, Illinois, and the Quad Cities, and did a lot of, you know, sort of not one-man band, but a lot of sort of solo work and a lot of live shots, you know, covering news. And then I got to Chicago in 92. Uh, the Tribune Company was launching CLTV, which was that 24-hour local news channel based, um, well, with the Tribune's help. And it was this little cable startup in Oak Brook. And that was my first uh, reporting foray into Chicago. I did it for a couple of years. Didn't really like covering news in Chicago. It was kind of depressing. But I always loved food. And I loved travel. And I loved drinking. And I, I remember I told one of my colleagues, Angela Miles, who's still in Chicago, like on day two, that I really wanted to cover food because I love, you know, Chicago is this great food town. Yes. And um, I just right place, right time. You know, 95, I was there and they were launching the Good Eating Show, which was going to be based on the Tribune's revamped Good Eating section every every Wednesday. And they needed somebody to produce and host the show. We had a the weather guy was the host of the show for the first couple months. And I took over as the host and I was producer and I did that for eight years. And so I did this Good Eating Show with the help and assistance of the good eating staff. And we had, you know, great, this was back when the food section had like 10 people at the Tribune. Now it's like three. Um, they had a full test kitchen. We did, you know, Julia Child came through town. We had her on the show. Emeril Lagasse came through town. We had him on the show. And so I got to meet all these people and really learn about food that way and producing a weekly half hour show. So that was really my entree into food. And then when they canceled the show in 03, I kind of shot myself around Chicago as a food reporter, which is an odd thing to say on television because there isn't there really wasn't that job anywhere. And they had food critics, of course, at newspapers and magazines, but they never really had a food reporter. And so I tried to carve out this niche and they and ABC was like, yeah, we have James Ward here doing criticism, but we need somebody to do our midday show. They were advanced. They were uh, expanding their 11 a.m. news. I remember Port Charles was the soap opera that was getting canceled on ABC and it suddenly <laughs> gave the local affiliate WLS an, an hour of news to fill an hour whole from 11 to noon. And so they said, sure, could you come on and do twice a week food reports? And that's, that's how it started in, uh, in 20, in 2003. Uh, how old were you? I mean, how old were you at that time? Were you? So that was 17 years ago. I'm 52 now. So 35. Wow. You don't look in your fifties, by the way. Just oh. being re being real. Not thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> you must be you must be exercising to work off all that calories you love to eat. No, I do, I do. In fact, um, one of the reasons we wanted to come down here to chilly northern Florida for a month was so we could go outside and at least get a walk in or a bike ride. I brought my bike down here, so I'm biking. It is going to be sixties next week, but um, no. But back at home, though, I'm I'm really religious about exercising. Um, I used to do hot uh, core power yoga. Uh, a couple times a week. I can't really do that anymore because it's hard to wear a mask when it, you're sweating your, you know, all, yeah. uh, for an hour. Um, so I do <laughs> virtual class with the, my old trainer that I used to work out with every week. I do a virtual class and I do see a trainer once a week. So I do, I, you have to work out with this job. Otherwise you, you are going to become like as big as a house. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and uh, so w w real quick, what part of Florida are you in Panama city? We're close. We're in Santa Rosa Beach. Gotcha. So I think we're about a 30 minutes from Panama City. I was in Panama City not too long ago. I took my family on a road trip and we went all the way down the, the, the Florida handle. And Panama City Beach was the best part of my trip. We had a great time. There. Really? Yeah, oh, I loved okay. it there. It um, looks a little cheesy, no? <laughs> I don't know. It was nice. We, we rented a condo on the beach and it was awesome. Okay. 
was awesome. All right. Yeah. So we're going to go to Destin. We're also near Destin. Awesome. Yeah. Good. Stay out there. Don't come back for a while. No, I, I <laughs> Nothing heard. good happening here. You know, it, was a, it was a long drive. We broke it up that we stopped in Nashville. Ah. And then we also stopped in um, Birmingham. Did you, to, did you go to Smoky Mountains? Um, well, yes, we, I did some media training um, at the Blackberry Mountain, oh, nice. which is uh, in East Tennessee. So, yeah, I we diverted there for a day or two days. And then we came down through Birmingham. I went to this great barbecue place called Saw's Barbecue because I wanted to get the famous Alabama white sauce in the barbecue world, which is not something we see very often in Chicago. In fact, Lily's Q, I think, is the only place that does Alabama white sauce on their menu. So we had the white sauce. And I'm going to hit it? What is sauce. it? I don't, I don't know what that is. It's mayo based, but it's also got uh, vinegar and garlic. And, you know, uh, it's like a it's mayo based instead of tomato based, basically. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's good. It goes mostly on chicken. Chicken is the big thing. They don't do a lot of pork in Alabama. It's mostly chicken, either fried or smoked. Um, so because my new career now of creating content for myself, I'm going to stop at Saw's on the way home for lunch and do a little story about Alabama white sauce. So are you... So you're doing, you're a one man band. So are you taking, you have a, like a, just a, a selfie and you're just recording yourself at in the restaurant? No, or how I, are you doing it? I invested in a Canon 5D Mark IV camera with a 2470 wide angle lens and also a prime lens. And I'm my own professional photographer and I'm shooting the video myself as I've been doing now for ABC for the last three, four months um, with this nicer camera. Now I've had a, a, a previous camera, just a Canon, like a prosumer camera. And I was shooting on that since COVID, since March. Uh, but a four months ago, I really upgraded my equipment and it's all shooting in beautiful 1080p, 60 frames per second. Um, and so that's what I do. And then I edit it on my Mac on Final Cut Pro. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's with technology these days. I mean, really, you're, you could do a lot of amazing things on your own. And, you know, for shooting myself, I'll just set it up on a tripod and I stand in front of the camera and I've got a monitor and I can see where I am in the monitor and I can see where I am. And I just I hit the record button and and I shoot myself that way. But I can also use my phone for, you know, for cutaways. I've got another camera for different angles. So I'm going to be experimenting now in my kitchen to really create some some new content. It's kind of exciting. Yeah, you know. It is exciting, um, and and you've been around it for a long time. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you have you have been the personality. But you haven't necessarily been doing all the editing and recording. I mean, you've been involved with this. So you kind of picked up as you went, I'm sure. But it's a lot harder than it looks. It's a lot harder than it works. But you know what? I go back to my first job in Upper Michigan in Escanaba in the UPA uh, when I was 22 years old, doing everything myself, coming up with story ideas going out and shooting them, doing the production, doing the editing. I mean, it was a different equipment, obviously, back then, but the principle is the same. And understanding how to shoot and how to edit and how to put a story together, I take that skill with me every day. So I, I never, I don't have any regrets about living in the UP or living in the Quad Cities because that really teaches you how to do a live shot, how to be resourceful. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I since I've been at ABC for seven, six, to the first 16 years, you know, I had cameramen that I worked with. I had an editor that I worked with who edited my stories, which was great. I could do other things. Now that business model has changed. And if you want to be in that business, you have to do everything yourself pretty much or be prepared to. Yeah, definitely. So I'm going to ask you a couple of early on questions, help my, um, help uh, anybody interested in, in, in their growing process in the business. Um, so what were your, do you believe in mentors? How did you get, well, as you were growing in your industry, how did you know, who did you go to for advice? Like, how did you decide which paths to take? Um, you know, there weren't really a lot of mentors in television for me. I mean, I had, you know, friends of my family who had been successful in other businesses um, who gave me advice. But television wise, it was a little bit harder. I had a professor, at the University of Wisconsin, that I was in touch with after graduation who was very helpful. Um, I remember actually some advice I got a long time ago from the husband of the woman who introduced me to my wife. How's that for a connection? Marilyn. Marilyn's husband, Bob, gave me this great advice to be an expert in one thing. Um, he said, if you want to be, you know, if you want to make like moccasins or you want to um, make uh, tapestries, you know, become the expert in that. Don't let anybody else sort of become that person. 
once you become the expert in something, people will pay you for your expertise. Lo and behold, that's what's happened. I mean, I'm doing virtual pizza parties, uh, virtual cocktail events, virtual tours for people because uh, pizza has become my subject. The riches are in the niches, as they say. Oh, that's good. I like that. Yeah. Um, and then what was a big challenge that you've had to overcome? And I'm just, these are just questions to help people who are coming up, you know, you're, yeah. you're established, you're done. So what, what are some big challenges you've had to overcome personally to get where you are today? Um, I think just being resourceful, um, you know, living by yourself in upper Michigan when you're in your early twenties and not really knowing anybody and knowing what you're doing, you know, that's where you make all your mistakes. And I think it's okay to make mistakes for sure. Um, you want to make those mistakes before you get to a bigger opportunity or a bigger station. And so I feel like I've made a lot of those TV mistakes early and just, you know, you believe in yourself and, I've pitched so many ideas and so many shows to national people and to agents. And I've been told, you know, thanks, but no thanks. And I just come back at it from a different angle and I just keep at it. And I think you, you've got to be a hustler. You know, one of the things I saw repeatedly in the comments in my Facebook, when I announced that I was leaving was, you know, Steve's always been a hustler. I think that's important. I mean, you got to get up every day and, and make a phone call and reach out to somebody that you maybe wouldn't before. And, and you never know where that's going to lead. I've had a couple of interesting leads since announcing this that I'm leaving that have you know, led to some interesting connections on LinkedIn. And I've had some interesting phone calls that I wouldn't have had if I just wouldn't have you know, gotten, on, um, gotten on the phone or sent a note out to somebody and asked for some help. So getting out of your comfort zone constantly. Oh, for sure. Yeah, constantly. Yeah. I, I mean, I, you, know, you say I'm established and I'm done. I'm not. I'm not established. I'm well, not done. I mean, I feel like every day, like, I feel like I got to get out there and prove myself. Yeah. Yeah. You're in, you're, you're in the next chapter of your life, but from people from the outside, they, they, they're like, man, if I could just, if I could just be like Steve or even do half yeah. of what Steve did, you know, cause you've been, listen, I mean, you are the personality that every, I mean, I don't think I know of any other food person. Like if you ask me just, who food personality from Chicago, I would say Steve Delisky. That'd be the only name I really think of. I don't think I think of anybody else. There are a couple other national ones maybe, but you've done very well. I mean, you're, you've done, a, you've, you've really Thanks. done a really good job with, uh, with this, this market. I mean, you killed it. You killed it. Thanks. Well, but I, a little bit, but a, a little bit was luck, a little bit, you know, being in the right place, you know, and, and having something to offer ABC seven at that time. I mean, think about, you know, it's opportunity, of course, but I had built myself up over the last eight, nine years of focusing on food to the point where I was an expert and knew the market well and could do everything myself and, you know, could produce myself. Day one at ABC7, we had our first planning meeting and then, I, you know, she introduced me to everybody and I said, give me a cameraman. I'm ready to go shoot a story. So, I don't know. I have, you ever, have you ever thought about opening a restaurant? I'm sure you have. Um. No, I haven't. I would never do that. I, uh, <laughs> you're you're, you're I not a masochist. <laughs> no, I, I'm going to switch. I'm going to plug my phone in here because I'm running out of battery car. No, I would never do uh, a, a, a restaurant business. I think that is, I, I just don't know enough about that. And I it's think you know, there are, well, it's, it's a very tough business. There are experts out there who know what they're doing. Um, I, I think I would go into it as, as a fun project if, I, if there was money behind it and it wasn't my own money on the line and I could take some risks, I would do it because I, I feel like, you know, I love the hospitality part of it. I love seeing people's reactions. And like I did a pop-up last a couple months ago for a pizza pop-up with a recipe that I've been sort of playing with uh, Sicilian kind of Sicilian inspired squares. I did it in Logan Square at a place called Pizza Lobo and wasn't expecting much. You know, I had about 75 slices that I'd made, 75 squares. We sold out in 25 minutes. So people were interested in what I was doing with pizza. And I liked seeing their reactions and hearing, you know, the feedback. So would I open a restaurant on my own? Probably not. But would I lend my name to something? Would I be a partner with somebody else as a consultant? Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, is consulting a big part of your business now? Yes. Um, at least uh, more than half, probably. Yeah, because I do you know, media training. I do, well, I do virtual events, which I'm not really sure is consulting, but you know, events for people and um, 
I did media training a lot before COVID. I think now that we're getting out of it, I'll probably come back and doing a lot more of that. And that's essentially teaching people in food and beverage to how to be on television, how to deal with uh, the live TV camera kind of a situation. And then the other part of the consulting that's going to be taking over a big part of this is the real estate part, working with real estate groups and helping curate spaces. Yeah, yeah you get, getting in front of the camera, Steve, <laughs> I've done it a couple of times and I, I become a stuttering disaster. I don't know. My confident John goes away to becoming a little timid mouse. It's, it's unreal what happens. Well, yeah, it's it's like anything, though. It's a practice. You know, the more you do it, the, the more frequently you get in front of a camera. You get you make those mistakes. Now, this is the problem with when you're in a market like Chicago, you can't just make mistakes on the major network affiliates and expect to get asked back. You want to make your mistakes on cable access. You know, I used to do a show called like Frontline Bensonville as a freelance thing. And it was for the Bensonville Park District. Sure. And we made, we made lots of mistakes there, but that's okay. You know, no, who was watching? Um, when you get to, you, yeah. you, you, you work out those kinks and then you get to the bigger station and then you can sort of be confident in what you're doing. Yeah. Um, you know, your channel, I, your channel is, you just started it. So you just started focusing on your YouTube because now you're, you're stepping away from there, but you're going to be Dave Portney. Everybody knows the rules. One bite. Everybody knows. I mean, you're, <laughs> You, you know, if you if you would have been doing the pizza show f from like 17 years ago, oh my God, you'd have like 10 million yeah. followers. Yeah, I gotta I gotta take a, a note from his playbook. I don't know how we did that. I, well, he's, they're I just know. they're hilarious. They're just goofballs. They're fun. They're fun. Yeah. But you you yeah. have a different thing. I mean, you're gonna be national producer. I, I guarantee you, if you just keep doing what you're doing and hitting it across the globe, or are you gonna do world or you do uh, national? I mean, the world is my oyster. Why do I, why limit it to national? Why right? limit I mean, it? <laughs> I mean, I mean, well, this is this is interesting though. One of the reasons I'm able to do this now, and um, the benefit of having things like WeChat or WhatsApp or Instagram, I can connect with people all over the world now. So I become friendly with the, the people who run these uh, Wolf and Sub Zero appliance line for all of Southeast Asia, and I met them through world's 50 best restaurants that I've been a part of for about 10, 11 years. And so I'm going to be doing some content for them, which is a gig I would have never imagined, but they certainly, they want content from the U S so I can do stuff for them in Southeast Asia. Oh yeah. Those are the top premium brands when it comes to, you know, uh, commercial and in, in uh, high end uh, uh, appliances. Well, Steve, I know you're a busy man, and I really appreciate you coming on the show. You've been wonderful. Um, I will uh, send you the clips when they're ready, a couple of weeks probably, and uh, it was a pleasure meeting you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on, and best of luck to you. Thanks, Steve. Take care of yourself. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Always Direct podcast. We'll see you again next time, and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.